Well, uh, welcome to this um, plenary session, shall we say, uh, that wraps up the first day of the conference. Um, my name's Adam Tooze, and it's been my great pleasure, along with Giancarlo, Mori, and Patricia, to be part of the organizing committee for this conference um, on the anniversary of Keynes's Economic Consequences of the Peace. Um, none of it would have been possible without the extraordinary work of the organizing team and the uh, administrative support that we've received, uh, nor would the event have been possible without the generous sponsorship of a truly dramatic list of sponsors. Uh, first, I will mention the Swedish Riksbank, um, uh, uh, Banca d'Italia and the Bank of England, um, INET, uh, the Cambridge branch of, the Marshall Library of Economics, King's College, SRI and the CFM, the Centre for Macroeconomics. We're enormously grateful and I'm sure everyone here is enormously grateful for their support for what has been a truly fascinating discussion. Um, but it's my particular pleasure, I think, to introduce this panel and to chair the discussion this afternoon um, because it brings together a really remarkable group of people um, uh, on the table uh, alongside me here. Uh, in, in alphabetical order, starting uh, on the right, uh, we have uh, Edward Carr, uh, Deputy Editor uh, of The Economist, responsible uh, for the editorial. He joined The Economist as science correspondent in 1987. After a brief stint at the Financial Times, he returned to The Economist in 2005, and it was his brilliant essay. In what I have to say, I think is a purple patch in the history of The Economist. I, I don't, there's nothing I read with greater pleasure right now than your journal. But in, amidst that purple patch, what really caught our eye was an essay, What If the Allies Had Been More Generous, in 1919. Now, uh, and this turned into an extended discussion of Keynes's contribution to the debate. This was part of your counterfactual uh, supplement that you had. Uh, and uh, as you all know, in the, in the way of The Economist, these essays are anonymous, but if you have somebody of Murray Obsfeld's pull on your team, that veil of anonymity is quickly lifted. And we <laughs> discovered that Edward Carr was the man behind this essay, and I'm enormously grateful to you for joining us. Uh, next, to, next to Edward uh, uh, is nothing less than a, a legend, and it truly is a thrill to be sitting here uh, beside um, Stanley Fisher, uh, former vice chair of the, the Federal Reserve, uh, former governor of the Bank of Israel, former chief economist of the World Bank, currently uh, an advisor, senior advisor to BlackRock's Investment Institute. Um, uh, truly a legend uh, of uh, modern macroeconomics uh, and a really fitting uh, contributor to a discussion about Keynes because after all Stanley Fisher is one of the key figures in the Keynesian counter-revolution against the rational expectations uh, push of the 1970s, his essay of 1977, which asserted and demonstrated the significance of monetary economic policy uh, in affecting uh, real output, uh, uh, rational expectations notwithstanding, you insist, <laughs> is, a, is a foundational paper. So it's truly an honor uh, to have uh, Stanley with us today. Um, next to me on my left um, is Cecilia Skingsley of the Swedish Tricks Bank. Thank you so much for your support uh, of our event and for your uh, being willing to join us today. She had a distinguished uh, career uh, as a journalist uh, and banking economist after uh, uh, graduating from the Stockholm School. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have uh, uh, another one of the great strands of the broad church of global Keynesianism with us on the, on the, on the panel today. And she is now um, a deputy governor at the Swedish Central Bank, uh, one of a distinguished panel of economists that advise that institution. And it's interesting monetary policy course mm -hmm. in the present moment. Thank you for joining us. And uh, next is Cecilia, uh, my friend and colleague, Jeff Mann uh, of Simon Fraser University, uh, professor uh, in the Department of Geography, uh, director of uh, Simon Fraser's Center for Global Political Economy. Uh, author with Joel Rainwright, uh, amongst other things, of a crucial intervention in the political economy and political theory of climate change, Climate Leviathan, uh, a book which was preceded by what I think is in many respects the most interesting intervention in the interpretation of Keynes that has been published in recent decades, a truly path-breaking book on thinking about Keynes as, as much a political theorist as a political economist, uh, uh, Jeff engages in the truly head-turning exercise of rethinking the history of political theory in Europe back to Hegel in terms laid out by Keynes. And it was striking, I think, today how people coming from very different vantage points in economic history and economics, indeed, 
converged on an understanding of Keynes as a theorist of the fragility of political economy, uh, which opens the door to Jeff's interpretation. So um, I'm really uh, excited by this panel, looking forward to the discussion. But first of all, please join me in, in uh, welcoming our, our visitors. <laughs> We have, the, we have the luxury of an extraordinary amount of time for this panel, not something a chair often gets to say, but we really could go on and on and on. Um, but I, so I thought what we would do is start with a relatively loose format, which is simply to ask each one of the panellists to respond to the prompt. In other words, what they take the contemporary relevance of Keynes's uh, youthful masterpiece to be. And I thought maybe we would just simply start in in order of, of the way people are arranged on the, the panel here. So, uh, Edward, if you want to give us the benefit of your, of your take, and then what we'll do is we'll ping things back and forward a little bit at the front here. I know how eager people will be to get involved, and we have all the time in the world to allow that conversation to unfold. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, one of the things I, I have to do for my sins is, is follow Boris Johnson's tweets. And... Um, <laughs> A few months uh, before he became Prime Minister, he tweeted that what do we have to think about but this Carthaginian process ahead of us in the EU? And I don't think he was referring to the Third Punic War. What he was referring to was, of course, Keynes and Versailles. And so it isn't just us here in this room who are thinking about what is the contemporary relevance of Versailles. It's on the minds of politicians too. Now, one thing that struck me is that towards the end of the economic consequences, Keynes writes, the forces of the 19th century have run their course and are exhausted. We must find a new way and must suffer again the malaise and finally the pangs of a new industrial birth. And you can't hear those words without thinking of Gramsci 11 years later who said something very similar and very famous. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Now, I'm a journalist and not an academic or a central banker, so when I look at Keynes, I'm obviously interested in what is going on at the time, but I'm also interested in what lies this sheds on the present. And there are so many avenues we could choose from, and we've been exploring the, some of them at the conference this afternoon, the coordination uh, of global policy, the role of sanctions, deflation, the ebb and flow of globalization, the rise of Germany, and China. But I want to draw your attention to the background to all of this, uh, which is that once again, I think we're at a moment when the old order is dying. We're moving rapidly from an era of technocratic democracy to, well, to something different. I don't know what it is. But the signs of that change are all around us. Donald Trump, the disintegration of the central parties in France and Germany and here in Britain, the hollowing out of democracy in countries like Hungary, the rise of populists in Mexico and Brazil, the crisis of confidence in Western democracy, the supplanting of technocratic government with the politics of identity, the trade war between the US and China, the rise of China itself uh, and its autocratic capitalism. So what does Keynes tell us about um, all of these phenomena? And I want to very, very quickly, I want to make five points. The first is something that he shows us. Uh, in, in, in the technocratic paradigm, disputes are settled with data uh, and statistics. But in the moment of crisis, they're settled by rhetoric and language. And I don't want to get into the question of whether Keynes was right or wrong, but what is undeniable is that this book is a brilliant polemic. It's fantastically well written. Your eyes sort of skate over the tables of German railway deliveries and that kind of thing. I, mean, I can't manage that. But what I do take in is the sweeping generalizations made with utter confidence. And they're bolstered by sort of fantastic and telling details. Of Clemenceau, he says he was throned in his grey gloves on the brocade chair, dry in soul, empty of hope, very old and tired. Keynes even notices the muscles on the back of Woodrow Wilson's neck. It's just... It's so lively, it's fantastic journalism, and he, he establishes, through the way he uses language, a truth that whatever you or I might think about how accurate and how correct Keynes was, that truth lives on, as Johnson's tweet attests. <laughs> Second thing in his use of language is the way that he, it's not just enough for him to say that Clemenceau 
Wilson and Lloyd George were wrong. They're also in some way immoral. Um, Clemenceau's immoral and, and, and sort of inflexible. Uh, Wilson's weak and vain. Uh, Lloyd George is calculating and, and sort of vicious in one way or another. And that is, again, a feature of our rhetoric today. We live in a, in a world of ad hominem attacks. It's, you can't just disagree with your opponent. Your opponent is a bad person. So that's the second feature of the book. Um, a third feature is that Keynes portrays Clemenceau particularly as living in a zero-sum world. And um, he thinks that journey's gain must be France's loss and vice versa. And he thinks that the police, peacemakers therefore were blind to a universe of positive sum possibilities. And as my former colleague at the FT, Gideon Rackman, wrote in his book, he thinks that today also we are living in a zero-sum world. And you can see that in the uh, unraveling of the rules-based order. You can see it in Donald Trump's bizarre beliefs about bilateral trade and his beliefs about how he should take on China unilaterally, not working with everybody else. And you can see it in security as well. Somehow, if Estonia is made more secure through NATO, on some sort of balance sheet logic, America must be paying for that in some way. So we live in a zero-sum world. The third thing, I, sorry, the fourth thing uh, that I think I take from this book is Keynes's appeal to put economics um, at the heart of policy making. Um, there's a sense in which it's all geopolitics. They're all jostling for position. Uh, the sense that you need to have economics there uh, it isn't there. It's all realpolitik. And today, that question is absolutely the heart of things again with America and China. On the one hand, does engaging with China naively hand it dominance? On the other, does res res resisting China and standing against it bring about exactly the sort of great power, power competition that we saw with Germany in the 19th century? And will that mean it kind of re-emerges with China? And then lastly, my fifth point is a, a European point. I've tried not to talk about Brexit, but I, I have to in this, this thing. Keynes thought that, that Europe worked better if there was some sense of everyone coming together. Clemenceau thought it worked better if everybody worked alone. Uh, it's something that Brexiteers here need to consider. So to wrap up, in comparing 2019 to the interwar years, uh, I'm not trying to say that we're about to see fascism. I'm not saying that. There are similarities, but I'm not saying that. But what I am saying that the economic consequences evoke five things. The power of rhetoric, the demonization of opponents, the marginalization of, economic, of economics, the, the zero-sum politics, and the taking for granted of European peace. And Keynes is a warning to us all. When the foundations begin to slide, much else slips along with it. Thank you. Well, th thanks very much. It's uh, a great uh, pleasure to, uh, to be here. And uh, usually I go to conferences and I want to leave. This one I... Uh, <laughs> Actually, I'm very happy to be here because there's such a variety of uh, backgrounds and uh, elements of uh, things I'd never thought of that I keep hearing. And uh, I'm very grateful to the people who put it on and the people who financed it uh, for uh, setting up this, uh, this, this uh, conference. Um, I was asked this morning by somebody, how, how did I learn Keynesian economics? Why am I a Keynesian? Um, I think the theme was, how could somebody who came from uh, a small town in the middle of uh, what my grandmother called the jungle, uh, how could a guy like that have reached uh, uh, attendance at a conference uh, like this? Well, I was introduced to economics uh, by uh, the son of friends of my parents who had just come back from the LSE uh, when I was fin just finishing high school. And uh, I asked him what did he do at the LSE. And he told me about economics, which was the first I'd heard about this idea. And I said, uh, well, so how would I learn something about economics? So he took two books off his shelf. Uh, one was Samuelson's Economics, 
and the other was the general theory. <laughs> and he said, you should read these two books. Well, I managed Samuelson's book. It was longer, uh, but you could read it more rapidly than you could read the general theory if you were trying to actually understand the general theory. I didn't think I would learn to understand the general theory on a first reading, but I certainly enjoyed, the, for the first time, reading uh, something that had been given to me as a textbook uh, that actually was written extremely well, although when I read the literature, I understand it's turgid and this, that, and the other. I didn't find all that. I just found the, the uh, wonderful uh, phrases that would pro crop up from time to time as uh, as uh, making the whole thing much more uh, interesting. Um, I went to the LSE and I heard references to Sayers today, to Richard Sayers, uh, who, from whom I learned uh, macro and money uh, and uh, who uh, shocked, shocked me severely when he announced to the class one morning, I was in Germany on the weekend and I visited Old Man Schatz. And I thought, you visited Hitler's banker? Am I supposed to keep talking to you? Am I supposed to keep listening to you? I had no idea about the continued existence of, uh, of uh, Hitler's banker. Um, but I also liked Sayers, so I was in a bit of a, con a, a, bit of a, d a tough spot. Mm. Eventually, I learned to live with people who knew both Schutz and Sayers, and, uh, did, uh, and I actually read, uh, read what uh, Schutz had written, and I don't know how innocent or guilty he was, but he was interesting. Um, on today's uh, discussions, I just want to respond briefly to a few points that were made that um, I, I think I could contribute something small. Um, there seemed to be some view today about if Keynes was systematically making money, he was probably uh, breaking uh, inside, uh, inside knowledge uh, constraints. It's not true. Um, I once sat at a dinner next to the partner of uh, Buffett. Uh, you may ask how I got to be sit next to the partner of Buffett. Well, it wasn't for my wealth that much, I can tell you. Uh, but I told him I was from MIT and he said, oh, he said, Paul Samuelson must be the richest economist who ever lived. Uh, I told Samuelson this and he practically went through the ceiling. He said he had no business describing my wealth to you. And I'm pretty... <laughs> I, I'm pretty horrified. <laughs> and he was right. I mean, the fact that you have a business relationship with someone doesn't give you the, the right to uh, gossip about, about him, even... Uh, well, we were friends of Samuelson's and they used to come to New York when my wife and I moved to New York and we'd have dinner together, him and his wife and me. And I'd always, as a matter of form, offer to pay. And he always replied the same way. That would be like money, move it, uh, money uh, moving uphill. <laughs> so, so I never got to pay for dinner, but uh, I did make the right offers uh, each time. Um, I would do one more thing about uh, playing in the markets. Uh, one day, Rudy Dornbush and I were working on some problem, and we realized that it implied that the pound was heavily undervalued. Uh, sorry, heavily overvalued. And uh, we decided that we wanted to uh, sell it. So we had never actually made any transactions as of then. And we went off to consult someone who would know, who was Paul Samuelson. This was before, <laughs> this was before I knew how wealthy he was. Uh, that's only partly true. Um, and 
we had laid out to him, he said, well, tell me why you think you want to do this. And we explained all the economics. And he said, OK, I'll go in with you. And we made quite a lot of money, especially for assistant professors. And uh, about three months later, we, go, we encountered what we thought was the same situation. And we went to him. And uh, he listened. And he said, I think I'll sit this one out. Needless to say, we made, we lost a lot of money <laughs> on that one. So there's a small sample of somebody who succeeded uh, from time to time. I'd like to add one thing and then get down to uh, serious stuff. Um, I had the privilege of giving the Robbins lectures at the LSE a long time ago when I'd left the, just after I'd left the IMF. And, um, I'd read uh, Robbins's diaries. There's a book, I, I think, uh, which show, has parts of the diaries of both Robbins and uh, Mead from uh, their uh, negotiations with the Americans over the uh, World Bank and the IMF. And the, these parts of the diaries are printed. And there is, uh, and I somehow found them, I don't know how. And I started reading, and there is an unbelievably wonderful uh, statement by Robbins on the occasion that Keynes crossed the, uh, crossed the uh, Atlantic and came straight into a meeting with the Americans negotiating over, I think, the World Bank. And the, the language is so fine and so lovely that you just can't ignore it. You just remember it forever. Especially if I remembered it now, I could say that more, thor more authoritatively. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful thi thing, and that's the impact he had on a guy who could actually write very well, who was, uh, who was Robbins. Anyway, so what do we learn from uh, Keynes and from the uh, the uh, economic consequences uh, of the of the peace, and I'll say some of this. Um, I wrote this before I listened to you, so I'll only draw on what's written here. Okay. Um, well, the first thing you you realize from uh, what Keynes says in the book is that. What, what is going on now is the opposite of the fact that most of what we learn is that there is a positive sum nature of many economic interactions. And there appear to be none in the things he's uh, com complaining about or, his, or the complaints he's dealing with. And I think you'd always leave the distribution of income somewhat aside as you say, that every economic interaction uh, has, is a positive sum game, but many of them are, and, uh, and uh, that's uh, something that you can't come out of that book without understanding. Keynes was very liberal, and I don't know where he started, but uh, he was liberal in the sense of believing that if you built the right economy, you would be building an economy which would make almost everybody better off. And that is seen not by what he wrote about the end of, the world, of world War I, but what he, what he did about the end of World War II, uh, where he probably more than uh, the American uh, um, uh, White was uh, responsible for much of the structure of the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF is not built on Keynes, uh, on Keynes's structure, but once that was the form that it was going to take, what he had to say in the debates was very important to the structure of what uh, was set up, and the same about the World Bank. As you all know, the uh, the attempt to build a uh, trade uh, institution failed. And uh, it was replaced not by an institution with a set of laws like the, like the IMF and like the uh, World Bank have, uh, but 
it was called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. That sufficed for some time into the 1990s. And then eventually the organization, the World Trade Organization, was set up, uh, not exactly the name that it had, had in the first drafts, but that was essentially what it, it was. And it was the completion of the structure of the international economy that Keynes uh, and uh, others, including uh, De Harry Dexter White, uh, were, uh, were building at the same uh, time. I'd like to say one thing which is not really about Keynes, but I think about the, the uh, economics that is being argued now about central banking in which you hear the statement frequently, well, the central banks cannot deal with the consequences of changes in trade arrangements. That is simply not true, except if the trade arrangements are, as they are today, so randomly introduced that you don't really know, if you're a banker, which way they're going to go. But if there was anything like a, a tariffs will be reduced gradually over the next three or four years and something like that. Uh, central bankers could deal with that as a uh, device that affects um, aggregate supply and uh, the economics of that we've known since the uh, 1980s and that's still there. Uh, so I'm, I'm sometimes uh, surprised that my friend, and he is a friend, uh, Jay Powell, uh, sometimes says that you can't do this uh, with, uh, with trade. The invention of the SDR was uh, partly uh, driven uh, by Keynes, and uh, it will come in useful. I just remind you, we heard today that the SDR is no, of no use. It may be of no use, but it, just to give you something, the German uh, delegation, the German ED executive directors at the uh, IMF always in voted in favor of the issues of SDR on principle. They said we have to have something like this in the system. And uh, they never wanted to use it. That's another matter. But they wanted it there, knowing that even a system, however good it is, any system built by human beings is going to need something like a lender of last resort to operate uh, effectively. I've sort of been tr trying to think about how to think about uh, what these institutions created for us. And the obvious place we'd go, and, and, and Edward just mentioned it, is uh, China and the United States, or the handling of the entry of China into the international system. Um, the, uh, there, are two, there are two books I'd recommend to somebody who wants to think about this hard. One is Keynes, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, the other is a book by Graham Allison of the Kennedy School called The Thucydides Trap in the first version of the book. Its title has changed repeatedly, uh, but the book hasn't changed. It's just uh, they're trying to get more, more people to buy it. I don't, I, I'm not sure if you buy it and later discover you've read it already under a different title if you, get, uh, if you can claim, uh, claim a refund. Anyway, the Thucydides trap uh, is, takes off from a book, uh, f from a, a writing by Thucydides on the war between uh, Athens and Sparta. And he says that when a new power is coming into a system, it frequently leads to war because the new power wants to take over the system. Well, what Allison did was going back, I think, to the 14th or 15th century, he counted how many times in the international uh, diplomatic field there were situations like this. And he came up with 16 over about four centuries. 
And of those 16, all but four led to war. I was sure until two years ago that that was not true of the way China had been handled by the George Bush and later administrations. I'm not sure now that China and the United States are working under an optimal arrangement that will produce peace. What is going on now would surely uh, frighten Keynes and bring forth some of the chapters that, and some of the uh, wording that we can find in uh, the economic consequences of the peace. Uh, because taking on a power which in some respects is showing more success than the existing uh, hegemon is not a very wise thing to do. And uh, I am from day to day more and more concerned that the way that this is being treated by the United States government is not only not very positive, it's not positive at all, it's negative. That relationship has been worsening from day to day for a long time and it's getting worse and worse. And I don't think it is consistent with a sort of philosophy of uh, interstate relations that is explicit in uh, the economic consequences uh, of the peace. Now I think of that very hard, but I'd like to take one, I'd just like to throw in one uh, question, big question. I, I asked myself, what would have happened if we had treated them well? They still would have wanted to ta overtake the United <coughs> States as the hegemon. Would that have happened? Would it have been stopped? I'm not sure. I just don't know what consequence there would be if we'd been more generous to the uh, Chinese. We were certainly generous at the beginning and for a long time, to the extent that it became an issue in American politics, and it's clear what the uh, voters who voted in Trump uh, believed about uh, what is happening with China, and it, most of it uh, happened when they were being treated well, according to the, uh, according to the rules that I think uh, Keynes would have liked. So I don't know what the answer to that is, and I think it is a question as to whether we will find, even if we reverse course, that this is a situation that does not lead to conflict. Uh, with those uh, happy thoughts, uh, <laughs> let me uh, thank you for uh, listening and uh, thank you for inviting me to this event. Thank you. Cecilia. Okay, um, so thank you very much also for being here. I can, I can say that so my day job is spent with um, negative interest rates and unconventional monetary policies and, and a bit of trying to assess the trade conflicts and what, what can be done or not be done um, uh, in the shape and form of monetary policy. So it's, it's great to be here to, um, to get um, into another set of problems. Um, makes uh, makes my life a bit more colorful. Um, I uh, Unfortunately, I didn't stay very long at university. I took my degree and then I ventured out in life. So um, when I read the book, I have to say, I read it more like a middle manager uh, because I've spent many years uh, as a middle manager. And I thought about um, the, um, the, the guys in the room um, and thought about how would they perform in an annual development dialogue, the one you know have with a manager and, a, and the employee? And um, so I thought about it as a, as a serious example of, um, of a really bad management failure. <laughs> this um, is the Versailles piece. Yeah, they wouldn't get any bonuses, I can tell you that. <laughs> 
So <laughs> let me let me go through uh, the three very important guys in this uh, in this drama that um, uh, Keynes uh, writes so elegantly about, and and let me sort of bring out what I think are the are the lessons learned for 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 now for for our generation where we are now in the early 21st century. Starting with Woodrow Wilson, uh, fantastic uh, characterization in the book. Uh, it is very clear for me, uh, for me, that uh, he needs to come down from his very stratospheric levels of how he wants to or think he wants to to, to run the, the world and run the situation after the peace. He basically has to get his hands dirty uh, and do compromises. Um, and you also not only have to do compromises when you want to move things, you have to love them. You have to love your compromises. And you have to force others that are part of the compromise to love them and, and, and stand by them as well. Um, as I see um, the, about the economic and political debate uh, as we see it around the world, and I share many of the, 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 the worries that has been expressed already here, um, I think there are a bit too many what I call ideological Puritans out there who are uh, on either side uh, and they say uh, if they don't get the optimized version of what they would like to see, uh, it's, it's useless. It's the scorching of the middle ground here that I, I think is, is very worrying. And I, I can also notice that the pundits that we all know of, central bank pundits, political pundits, uh, are going in the same direction. It's, uh, it's, it's scorching the middle ground, and, uh, and it's no, not many who are, are standing in favor of compromises. I know compromises are gray, uh, but uh, it's certainly something that, that needs to be loved with great passion. Uh, which takes me to, um, to uh, the UK uh, Premiership, Lloyd George, uh, which very spectacularly, I think, managed to minimize his room to maneuver. Um, uh, by setting up an election and, uh, and be overtaken by events and, and turn into a, a very populistic short-term view. I think being a politician is about, um, to the best of your ability, define what room you have to maneuver and, and keep that room to maneuver because there will, will always be, again, pundits and, and ideological Puritans who will try to rein you in, to try to take over the narrative. And as a, as a political leader, you have to be more leader than actual political uh, and uh, define the narrative and stick to it and, uh, and maintain the room to maneuver. And he very spectacularly gave all that away. Um, so that, that, is, um, uh, that, is, uh, that is a stunningly bad example of, of um, performance uh, in a development dialogue I would have with him. Uh, which takes me to Clemenceau, uh, and Clemenceau is, uh, is active in doing something that we, we nowadays recognize, uh, unfortunately, on Twitter, uh, which is trying to bully your opponent into submission, which never works, which never works. Uh, and he's very much uh, a guy who maintains the view that the world uh, is a zero-sum game. Um, which we know is wrong, especially when it comes to economics. And he has completely lost the plot that if I help you, you can help me back, and we will both be at a rock. Now, I can, I can, in a way, understand that they were all stuck in a very difficult situation. They had to move things out of a, of a, of a very different corner uh, situation, and it takes a lot of guts to do that. Um, and here, to just move over a little bit to our contemporary issues, um, I think how you see the world determines your actions. Um, how you see the world determines your actions. Uh, and I think we are in a pretty bad place now, where we are, 2019. Uh, there is a lot of anxiety, there is a lot of downside risks. And I don't want to come out as complacent. Um, but I would like to stress that there is a lot of knowledge, uh, there is a lot of experience, uh, and we are standing on the shoulders of these people who have been here before us and made a number of mistakes. We also know that there are a number of tools to use. And I take um, inspiration from what Keynes wrote about, since I'm in central banking, um, the importance of maintaining stable and low inflation. Uh, he expresses very elegantly about the risks of, of um, some groups in society being, being uh, 
hurt very badly by, from inflation, others are being protected. And we can see how that sort of resonates today, uh, but with technological changes. Uh, and having stable and low uh, inflation is a sort of one of these um, foundations that we can provide so that people can, can go on and, and handle other kinds of risks as they, they move on in the economic system. Um, another comment is on the relationship between economists and, and um, decision makers, if I can call them politicians uh, and, uh, and top bureaucrats. Um, there is a seminar that is going to take place tomorrow, which has a Swedish connection. There's a Swedish connection between Keynes and economists. It's written by Lars Jonung and, and Benny Carlson. Uh, on how, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great explanation there on how Swedish economists at the time, the 1920s and 30s, and, and also since then, so it takes a very active part in the public debate and also uh, take public offices in different ways. Um, and I think this is, should be supported. I think it's important that economists uh, are taking part in the discuss discussions. But given what I said previously about the importance of, of making somewhat gray but still uh, compromises, um, giving advice can be explained as pretty cheap. You know, it's cheap to give advice. It's, um, it's um, money, um, sorry, uh, talk, is, talk can be cheap. Uh, making decisions, on the other hand, and stand by decisions, that's very hard work. So what I would like to see is more active economists in the public debate, more active economists taking public offices, but also try to support those who try to make steps in the right direction. It won't be the perfect world or the perfect decisions, but we should, we should, um, we should glorify and we should, we should um, support those takes even the smallest step in the right direction and, and not also always go for, for the, the optimal solution but because that will never come or it will might get a lot worse beforehand. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. All right. Is it, can everyone hear me? Is this all right? So I wanted also to thank everyone for being here but also especially the organizers both the organizers, organizers and the people who put it on uh, doing all the work behind the scenes. I, I really appreciate it. I've learned a ton today. Uh, much of the discussion touched on issues that, with which I am largely unfamiliar. Uh, I learned a lot about the history of the 1930s that I didn't know the details. Um, but I'm very grateful to be here. And uh, my reflections uh, today are spurred largely by the work that I've done that focused mostly on the general theory. Uh, and I think it's very easy, uh, perhaps for you, but certainly for me, to beca because I look at Keynes's work as a whole from a sort of backwards perspective, it tends to lay out like a solar system for me with the general theory as the sun. And I, t I tend to understand all of the other things as I read them through how I understand the general theory, which is not, of course, I know the right way to go about things, and it's not how we think, and it's not how we write or live. Um, so this was a very interesting exercise for me to return to an earlier piece of work and try to restrain myself from seeing in it always the seeds of the general theory, but also to see the connections across them. And, uh, and the, the most important connection across the, those t almost 20 years, let's say, for me, is the, and I get this from almost everything I read from Keynes, is a sort of intimidating but uh, hopeful combination of, of a kind of constant fear of disaster, but also some hope. They, they seem to live beside each other in his work. And so he, all of his work is filled with actually quite dire predictions sometimes. You know, the men will not, uh, I have them written down here, men will not always die quietly. Uh, the revolution is just beyond the borders of, of, of reason. We, there, in some ways, I think if Keynes was alive today, he would say there's a reason we call the central bank the, the lender of last resort, because once we get past the last resort, the whole social order breaks down. Um, and there's this sense of foreboding, I think, that resonates throughout this entire book. Uh, and I asked myself, okay, so what is he afraid of? What is, it, what, it, what, what, what is, what is the or else that looms over so much of, the, of this story? Um, and as you may know, or some of you probably familiar with this literature, there's actually a long line of, of uh, left criticism of Keynes that, that 
that understands, for the most part, it began actually just after the general theory was published in the 1930s, and much of it understood itself as having been recognized by Keynes. So the general theory emerged as a response to socialism, as a response to working class activism. And, and, and many people claimed that, that Keynes was proof that the working class was breaking the surface of history and becoming an autonomous force. This is a very common critique in, in Western Marxism. I think that that's a misreading, a very, a very uh, self-absorbed, let's say, misreading of what Keynes was actually afraid of. So I, I wanted to ask myself, what is he afraid of? What has he come to save? And what, what did he want to save it from? And to me, I think that if you, the, the, the theme that runs through everything that he wrote, but certainly it's already there in the economic consequences, is it's, it's civilization itself that's at risk. It's the social order itself. And insofar as that's the case, if he asks himself what he's afraid of, I think he, he, he looks at history. He looks, he looks as far back, perhaps, as the French Revolution. But certainly, he looks at Russia at the moment. And he sees what he fears, a kind of breakdown of the social order, a rabble that is subject to demagoguery, and the rise of forces of reaction and revolution, as he mentions, in the economic consequences themselves. I think, to be honest with you, that the most fundamental way in which this book matters today is that it resonates with I hope I'm not saying this just for myself. It resonates with my own sense of a very similar existential precarity at this moment. The book speaks to me, and I think probably many of you, but I shouldn't say for anyone else, of a, of a kind of moment of, of, of anxiety with which the clarity of previous answers, are, is, it's no longer sufficient for the moment. Civilization for, for, for Keynes actually is of course just like what a lot of people identified today earlier in his discussion of the, of the piece itself. It's a fragile, complex, delicate mechanism. In fact, later on when he wrote of his, his early beliefs in the 1930s, you may know this, he says civilization itself is a thin crust maintained only by the guile of very few who understand what's actually at risk. And I cannot help but feel sympathy with that somewhat elitist perspective. But I, I, I think that it's the relevance of this book reaches through me, reaches to me at, at, in, in precisely this manner. And I think that, uh, Stanley mentioned it earlier, but I think if Keynes were around today, he would say that what he feared is coming true. The rise of populisms, the rise of nationalisms, the rise of demagogues, the rise of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an instability and a precarity that, that makes his ideas actually have an extraordinary broad extraordinarily broad appeal across groups of people that I think would not normally understand themselves as having sympathy. And I think that, the, for example, uh, the, the celebration of Piketty's book when it appeared in 2013, and the celebration of the book, as you may know, not only from what we might think of as centrists or uh, reasonably moderate political groups, but also from the left itself, shows you the, peel, the, the, the feeling of the precarity of the moment. And I, and I think that Keynes captures this in this book uh, very, very well. Um, so I, I was actually going to speak quite a bit to some of the stuff that came up before around, uh, around sort of populist unrest and that kind of thing. But I, I, I will instead turn to another thing that I could not help but thinking of, and perhaps this was true of you too when you were reflecting on the book so recently. But I could not help but think that we desperately need a Keynes for the climate negotiations. I, my anxiety around climate change may be, may be heightened by more than some of yours. I unfortunately work with climate scientists, and so I hear the bad news every day. Um, but I, I kept wishing that we had a kind of expose of the UNFCCC so that I could learn these details and, and, and have the whole thing shredded before my eyes. Um, but I do think, to some extent, it's subject to many of the same critiques that, that, that Keynes was throwing at, at the, the Paris Peace Conference. And I, I can list a few of them. These are quotes directly from him. It is certainly the policy of old men. It is simultaneously appears to be crucially important and so unimportant as to be mundane and boring. It is, as he also says of Paris, an unwieldy polyglot debating society. Or he describes actually all inter-ally discussions that way. And he says that it inevitably ends up being dominated by those attached to the status quo. 
Now, any of you who know anything about the UNFCCC, I think, would probably share my opinion that it is all of these things. Um, but I think what is even more important in this moment, if we're thinking about what this might matter, is that, as you all know, just a few years after this book came out, he says his famous quote, which I stole for the title of my book, uh, in the long run, we are all dead. And uh, I should say, actually, I had a really bad academic-y title, and the press chose that title, but at any rate. <laughs> but, uh, but he said, in the, lo in the long run, we all dead. But you may know that many years later, he reflected on that, and he said, I once said, in the long run, are, we are all dead, but I could have also said that in the short run, short run, we are all still alive. As long as there is peace, we can hold out for something better that may come around the corner. That's my own paraphrase at the end. I think that one of the most challenging things about this, though, and maybe perhaps we reach the limits of what Keynes can provide us with right now, is that with facing something like the, like the climate crisis, a politics of deferral is no longer possible. We, there is no possibility of staving off the crisis in the hope that something will better, better will come along unless you believe that we can do carbon capture storage, carbon capture and storage at the scale that is now physically impossible. So we, we've reached a point where, to some extent, the, the peace-like stability that might find its analog in the climate condition is no longer there. And insofar as that's the case, the politics of deferral, the politics of placation, perhaps, that Keynes sometimes suggests is no longer at hand. And the answer then is, is unknown. Because it, because it comes to seem as if the radical option is the only option. And insofar as that's the case, it doesn't fit with how I understand Keynes to have looked at the world. But I cannot help but read the book and have my own anxiety stirred again, uh, which happens actually with virtually everything he's written. Anyway, thank you very much. Well, thank you. So trying to um, pull together um, those four fascinating um, prompts, as it were, for further discussion, it seems to me that we have um, the first two, really. I, it could be summarized, I think, as guests is distilling out of Keynes a concern about transition. We formulated it in distinct ways. Edward was referring to, to Gramsci. Uh, Stanley was referring to uh, the Thucydides problem, or a great power problem, Gramsci's notion of, a, of an order in transition giving rise to morbid symptoms. Um, then Cecilia picked out for us, I guess, a theme which has preoccupied several people in the course of today's discussions, which is Keynes's incredibly fascinating, perhaps misleading in historical terms, but nevertheless instructive commentary, one might even say a kind of bestiary of malfunctions, of, of action, which is key to his conception of how order is achieved. It's achieved through action, but then also from action can clearly issue disorder as a result of the vices which you so nicely uh, uh, highlighted for Cecilia, Cecilia the, the, the inability to love compromise, the necessity of it, the inability to love it, the, the, the self-obstruction of a politician looking for uh, support and thereby foreclosing room for manoeuvre, and then the bullying zero-sum kind of logic. All of these pathologies, if you like, of action. One could, I think, multiply, but, but that will do the trick. And then another common theme uh, which came out more and more loudly uh, in both your comments is really the, it, the, the deep conservatism fundamentally uh, of Keynes. If we think of Keynes at the general theory as, a, as the radical, the man, the iconoclast, the man who remakes economics, what's so striking about the economic consequences of the piece, even down to its economics, is, is, is their conservatism mm -hmm. with, with the famous line about inflation, mm -hmm. which as we were hearing earlier on today was subsequently revised as Keynes moves towards a more liberal position on, on money. We also discovered earlier today about his vested interest in a conservative <laughs> monetary policy. And then um, exactly what I was hoping for from Jeff, namely both a deep resonance uh, with that Edwardian sense of anxiety, but then the basic question of whether our problems are not even worse in the sense that, you know, it may be vastly over-optimistic that in the long run we're all dead. <laughs> Um, some people are going to die quite soon. Already are. Uh, already are in the Bahamas. Um, uh, and that 
that basic illogic, that basic inconsistency in Keynesian economics, which consists precisely in dissociating the short run from the long run and refusing the idea that a series of short runs consistently add up to some general, general equilibrium which exists outside time, and insisting instead on the need for a fix. Now, that that that, that mode of deferral, that inconsistency will not, will not wash, it will not cope with a problem which does need a radical solution that is consistent. And then that just leaves us with a series of climate negotiations. So those seem to me to be really four very promising uh, routes for further explanation. Um, I'd open up the floor at this point, um, before we go back to the panel perhaps, for, for insights, for questions, for suggestions from your side. Uh, James, I'm going to make a list. I'm going to I'll work my way through it bit by bit. Um, James. Yeah, thank you all for very stimulating comments. Uh, I would say as pessimistic as these comments have been, particularly Stanley's, I, I actually fear that things are even worse than that. And I say oh. that on, on the basis of the economic consequences. So you're right, we have the Thucydides trap. China can't credibly commit to not renegotiate the order down the road. That incentivizes the U.S to bring what it perceives as an inevitable conflict forward. We also have, as Keynes noted throughout his career, the economic manifestations of this, global economic imbalances, the asymmetric burdens this creates, that is essentially Trumpism, right? China, you adjust. China says, no, America, you adjust. But as I say, I think the economic consequences of the peace suggest things are, are far worse because of the mentality that we now have, and that's the first sentence of the book, the power to become habituated to his surroundings is a marked characteristic of mankind. We, as in 1914, have become so used to the remarkable success of the post-war order that we become enormously reckless. And Trump, again, is a manifestation of this. Boris Johnson is a manifestation of this. We assume that things can only get so bad. We don't realize that we still have the same old problems. We have these new problems of climate change. We haven't resolved them, and yet we are acting as actors were in 1914, assuming that the system is totally durable and disaster-proof when it's obviously not. I'm going to bring uh, David Johnson in, and then the I want to pick up on something Cecilia said about Lloyd George and that he boxed himself in by holding an election. Um, and I say this partly because tonight there's a vote in the House of Commons about when to have an election, which may turn out to be an extremely consequential event. Um, and I think Keynes, my understanding of it, Keynes shared that view. So when you read Keynes, I always found a consistent theme was his horror of elections. Uh, he thought democracy would go so much better without elections. Um, or at least that they always came at the wrong time, he thought. The trouble with elections is they would be really good if they didn't happen when they happened. But there's never a good time to hold them. So yes, Lloyd George was boxed in by his election. And I think Keynes's horror of elections came from his memory of 1918. The horror of the 1918 election stayed with him all his life, I think. But Wilson had his election, the midterms, uh, in November 1918. And the problem with them, people always said, was they came too soon because the war was still going on, just. If only the war had finished, people could have taken stock, but they were still voting in the throes of the conflict. And so Lloyd George sort of Wilson lost those elections and got the Congress that then boxed him in. Lloyd George held his elections after the war. That was the wrong time because then people were vindictive and punitive. And then in France, they delayed their elections until after the conference, and that didn't work either because Clemenceau tried to rise above it, and the French elected a far right, you know, mass far right. There's never a good time to hold elections. And I just feel that there's a kind of echo of that now. Uh, so we've lived through a century where people's faith in democracy was partly a faith in elections. Um, and now I'm not sure we have that faith so much. And there is some kind of connection there. I mean, I don't think you can take the Keynesian view that democracy would go better without elections. But there is an increasing view that democracy needs a lot more than elections. Um, including around issues like climate. And that that may be a link across the century but over the intervening period where there particularly have been times where people have just thought, well, wait for the next election and that will sort it out. I think that, that faith is going. But also, there is never a good time to hold an election, and I think the vote in Parliament tonight is going to reflect that. Just a, a couple of comments. First of all, on, on the first speaker, what, what strikes me is the similarity when... There, there is, um, it's increasingly, there's no obvious leader, un unlike in, in 1945 and during the Cold War when the US was a clear leader. And what's particularly um, troubling to me is that rather than use the multilateral trading system as a way of persuading 
China to come in and change its behavior, the US is actually you know, kicking everyone else, kicking sand in everyone else's eyes and going it alone. And the same thing is true to a slightly lesser extent, but it's also true in security. You, know, you don't see um, a sense of the US using its alliances, which are priceless, frankly, I in order to reinforce the system. You see the US um, weakening, tensionally weakening the system. And, th and that's why Trump is a morbid symptom, in my view. On, on, on elections, yes, I mean, it is, it is so interesting how um, you know, we looked at Hungary recently and how Hungary has used precisely all the furniture of, of democracy and, if, in a sense, turned Hungary into a one-party state. And, and I, think it's, I think it's not just a perception. I think it's true that elections are not enough. And we're seeing in this country from week to week how each um, encroachment on the institutions by one side justifies the encroachment by the other side. And I don't know how one gets out of that sort of arms race in institutions, I, and you did a fantastic radio series on, on democracy, and I'd be interested to know kind of how you think you get out of this, this sort of terrible spiral downwards. Uh, you know, the, the model of democracy as a pendulum between, between the two sides seems to me not the right metaphor anymore. The metaphor is now sort of helter-skelter as each side, you know, you, you know uh, builds on the abuses of the, of the last. I'm just going to bring in Elise. I have a remark and a question to Joffman, but just before... Uh, Stanley, you were so pessimistic, and I'm afraid that maybe my way of presenting the balance of power versus hegemony had some sort of... Uh, uh, I, I started to be pessimistic in the morning, but <laughs> so, so I feel that I should now cheer you up, and that's what I'm, I'm going to try to do. But for the people who do not understand, I, I really showed this morning that Trump is an endogenous outcome, and it's not something that is coming as exogenous. But I want now to ask you a question and start first from your quote, because in my paper I quote it. It is from the new statesman of Keynes, and he says, and look at this, the end, because you didn't go to the end. You start with, I have said in another context that in the long run we are all dead, but I could have said equally well that in the short run we are still alive. Life and history are made up of short run. And how does he finish? Britain should build up its naval strengths and wait for the dictators to make mistakes. So the end is about fighting. And if the end is about fighting, I would like now to ask a question. You speak about the climate, cl climate change. Don't you think that if Keynes would be today here, he wouldn't speak about the very small question of CO2, but going to the real problem, which is the population increase in our world. Jeff, do you want to come back? Sure. Um, or do you want to go? No, no, you, you start and I'll, I'll follow up on the uh, elections. Should oh, okay. we have them? Or okay, not? sure. Um, so uh, I, I have two ways of coming at your question. Thank you very much for it, by the way. The first is that if Keynes was alive and Keynes was still Keynes, the Keynes say we resurrected his himself from when he passed away and didn't he didn't live through the following decades, then I agree he probably would point to population. But I I I don't think he should. I, I don't think that's the main problem. Uh, I, and I think and I, I like to think that he would have s witnessed the pr the the unfolding of history in the post-war world to be a demonstration of the fact that in many ways his uh, one-time premonition that perhaps the population's problem would solve itself uh, w came true to some extent. Now I know that the population is growing and this is frequently identified as sort of the fundamental ecological problem, but I, I actually disagree. It's the level of consumption by a, a relatively small minority of, of the planet. The, the climate change is the product of, of the activity of the global north. The vast majority of people on the planet do not over-emit. Um, and this is not to say we should all live like uh, folks who haven't been so fortunate as us. But it is to say that I think calling the root of the problem population is in many ways to transfer blame and to for force us to, to, no 
to allow us to not look at it's actually our, our consumption patterns and distribution distributional functions. So something to which Keynes was spectacularly oblivious. I mean, if you think of the beginning of the book and his description of how uh, in a world before 1914, I think the phrase is anyone could, look, sitting yeah, in their yeah, bed, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. send their manservant out to acquire the produce of the world. And, you know, c c clearly a fraction of 1% of the richest country on earth could do that. But, but as far as Keynes is concerned, this is, this is the thing, this is the world that he has lost. But so, so, no, I know, you wanted to come back on the election. Yeah, part. no, I think that uh, the elections always come at the, the wrong times. And uh, how do you maintain le political leadership through the election cycle? Well, first of all, we should thank God that we are living in a part of the world where we can structure our, our development or our society uh, through a political process, which is uh, where we have recurrent elections. Um, so that is the first thing I, I like to put out. Um, I think, I think uh, the electorate, uh, I mean, democracy is giving a, the electorate a chance to express preferences. Um, and preferences are not always pretty, but it depends on from which perspective you look at preferences and how they change. What, what many like to call populism uh, is to some other people uh, an expression of um, growing fear about work opportunities and life opportunities. Some people express populism and others are saying this is because we are unhappy about growing differences in living standards. Um, worries over immigration, um, says some, others says populism. And I, um, we may not like what the electorates are saying, uh, but they have a right to say it. Uh, they have a right to express preferences. We saw the Green parties came in the 70s and 80s because the electorates, at least of Europe at the time, didn't think that the conventional parties were, were doing enough on that side. And I, I always try to be optimist until I'm either overproven or dead. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I want us to stay with the narrative that um, a democratic system is capable of absorbing these changes in preference. Uh, and that we also have tools to manage these changing preferences. Because if we don't believe in that, what should we believe in? I, I'll just interject, abusing the privilege of the chair very briefly, that the one electorate that, that David didn't mention was the German electorate, uh, who, in a sense, make the avoidance of the Turkish option, uh, that which we were talking about earlier today, possible. In the sense that they elect, by a huge majority, a group of politicians who are actually willing to sign the peace. Because, not because they're traitors, but because they judge that a scenario of armed resistance to the Allies will be a complete disaster for Germany, that down that path lurks the terror, which is the Russian question, which is not Stalinism, not T-34s rolling eastwards, but anarchy, mass starvation, and disaster. And uh, politicians from both the German SPD, from the forerunner of uh, Angela Merkel's CDU, steal themselves to sign this treaty because they judge that that is in the best interest of, of holding Germany together. And it's an incredibly fine balance. Um, uh, Albert Richel earlier on today was playing through the counterfactual of a monarchist government in Germany being forced to sign the treaty and this would have been better. It could also very equally have produced civil war. So the democracy at this moment also on the side of Germany demonstrates considerable resilience in the face of absolutely massive, massive stress. In fact, it's too easily ignored. Uh, our friend here in the, in the orange dress. Thank you. Um, I, I want to ask for some further reflection on something Cecilia said, including from you, Cecilia, about the role of economists in times like these. And you said you would like to see more engagement in these policy questions. It took me back to um, Robert Skidarski's introduction to the day when he said there was a tension between Keynes, the insider, the participant in policy, and Keynes, the outsider, and the different truth requirements involved in each role. So in times like these, when you have, as we heard, I think, from Ed and others, um, more ideologues who are not open to um, uh, the, the, the <laughs> truth requirements that um, academic economics uh, imposes on us, is that then a recommendation for more activism? What, what is the right kind of role? And I suppose it goes to these broader questions about the role of expertise at the moment. Should we get a okay, I'll take some more. So Harold was next on my list. I had uh, three points, one of which came out of the, uh, the, uh, the audience discussion already. Um, David's uh, question about elections, which I think is really central because we've been 
discussing a lot about what the relationship is between uh, democracy and uh, disorder and, uh, and fragility. Um, and uh, I, I wondered whether we might not counter a bit of the pessimism that we've had about this um, in the sense that technology is changing things and uh, opening up more information to people. Uh, so in the past, uh, it was often d discussed in terms of the UK problem about the first-past-the-post system. Uh, but in, in practice, if you looked at what happened in the Brecon and Ratnashire election, uh, there's a kind of information now about what kinds of deals you can make um, in the, in the run-up to an election uh, that may mean uh, that elections in the future really become much more interesting processes and ones that reflect uh, much more of the discourse that, 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 that's around. And so, uh, you know, I think uh, w when we thought, um, and it was part of uh, Edward's story about uh, data coming in, um, in in normal times and being important, uh, that this, this really might be uh, some kind of ray of hope. Um, and the second point that I, I had uh, was in relation to two of Edward's points that had a kind of tension uh, um, within themselves. And I think that uh, Diane already picked that up. Um, that uh, you, you, you thought um, at one point, uh, I think it was your fourth point, uh, that uh, economics was really important. And then the first point, however, was that um, uh, facts and data don't matter so much in extraordinary times, but uh, rhetoric matters. Or you might put it in another way. Uh, there's an extraordinary discussion now about uh, narrative. Uh, everywhere uh, you see references to narrative. Uh, Bob Schiller just did this book on narrative economics. Um, and uh, so narrative is extraordinarily powerful. And it's in a sense what Keynes was doing when he, he wrote that uh, that. that, that that polemic in 1919, it's, 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 full, of, uh, it's full of a narrative. Um, it's full of a narrative about the psychological flaws. That's the point that uh, Cecilia uh, brought up. But it actually makes it more difficult. This was the point I was making in the morning discussion. It makes it more difficult to translate uh, some of the, the policy implications into reality because the people who are the subject of that narrative obviously react against it. And uh, Wilson and uh, uh, Lloyd George and Clemenceau uh, don't like it. So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of danger uh, there of the rhetorical or the narrative um, uh, uh, strategy. And then a, a sort of final observation, maybe a bit linked to this, and there's something that was neither in the discussion nor in Keynes's um, economic consequences of the peace. Uh, but we know now as historians, it's very, very important to the 1919 process. And in a sense, um, you know, it came out when uh, Cecilia said that um, Woodrow Wilson should have come down from his stratospheric levels. Um, I, I thought uh, you might have interpreted that in another way, because his blood pressure was just extraordinary. It was 220, uh, so 220 to 250. So readings that would horrify any normal <coughs> physician. And indeed, he had the first of a series of strokes in Versailles. Uh, in, 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 actually, I think in Versailles, but in Paris, in the, in the Paris Peace uh, Conference. And his position in, in Paris clearly raises the issue that is also important about the psychological and physical health of people who are making decisions. Um, and that's not an irrelevant question in today's world. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, it really, really, I, I think, you know, we might put that on the forefront. So it's true that, you know, there are old men making the decisions, in your point, but there are old, very sick men making decisions. So who would like to come back? Second, and, come yeah, back I, I mean, I, th I completely agree about the tension, because I think the tension is there in Keynes. I mean, um, he both uses, uses language and argument in a, in a way as if he's a foot soldier in, in one of these wars. Um, it's, it's very provocative and very emotive. But at the same time, he wants economics to have a central part in policy making uh, and, and laments the fact that it doesn't have a bigger part. So I, I think, um, you know, I was being descriptive there, and, and I think that's, that comes through very strongly in the text. And it goes to what Diane was saying about economists. You know, we all, we all know what Michael Gove said about experts. 
And we all know how, in some bizarre way, uh, you know, months of work on a model produces an estimate of the implications for the economy of a particular kind of outcome of Brexit. And it's waved away as if in, in two seconds by someone who's done no work and no thought. And in some, in some strange universe that we live in at the moment, those two statements have sort of equal validity. I'm, I'm all for um, economists having a bigger role. I think, it, you know, but it's, it's a sense of the morbidity that, that they don't and that they, they can't. And, when we find a way to admit um, expertise and to weigh expertise, I think that's a symptom that we're on the way to getting over this. Yeah, um, I, this picks up a bit on David Runciman, but I think it also underlies, it's, there's a kind of implicit uh, undergrowth in the um, economic consequences, which has been touched on by several, and that is the, the tension, the stress that arises through the coexistence of two different sets of institutions occupying, in a sense, the same social space, each with a asserted legitimate claim to allocate resources and distribute the income and wealth generated by their use, the, the institutions of the market and the institutions of the political process. And you know, in the 30s, indeed, that stress reached the breaking point in, in much of Europe, and almost did in the United States. We, we underestimate how close, in 1932-33, the US came to, uh, and, and through that first minute, ex-Roosevelt. So that, to me, is, in a way, the deep message, the sort of subterranean message from the economic consequences of the peace that is most profoundly relevant today. And I just close by saying, I think what Jeff Mann put on the table might, I mean, as Hemingway said, it would be pretty to think so, but it might offer some path forward, which is William James to Jimmy Carter, some kind of moral and economic equivalent of war that can transcend the distributional con conflicts that express themselves in this uh, overlap of market and political institutions in having, if you like, a, a common cause. And what is, of course, most frustrating, certainly from anybody with my sort of accent, is to see leadership in the United States, and in, in, in the executive branch at least, that is absolutely dedicated to evading and losing what represents perhaps the, the last good green hope that we have. If we take a look at economic history, we've had progress uh, for about three centuries, okay, since the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and also in economics, we've learned a lot, and we've learned that, you know, there, there, are, there are these centrifugal forces that are put, that, in a sense, moving towards progress, and we, you know, we know that markets and the behavior of markets have a lot to do with that, okay, and so there's something that tells me that you know, this is not the end of the world. We're not going off a cliff, okay? It's something that could be temporary. I can't say the, the things you're worried about, okay? It's not that it's temporary, but that there are these deep forces that will move us forward. And I, I haven't heard much of that. I, I'd pick up with Michael. I, I think Michael has a, has a great sense, has a good point there. Um, because uh, uh, we've been in, uh, in difficult times before, and I, when we see with the health of decision makers, um, if they have problems 1919, I mean, think about what it's like being a decision maker nowadays, where there's a constant flurry of, of tweets and, and et cetera. Um, and it, it certainly doesn't make it easier when, when the attitudes to facts are, are becoming um, uh, inflated. Um, I think. We are living in a time in history uh, where there is a lot more questioning of the uh, sort of um, regular foundations of power. But we've been through this before in history before. Uh, and the, the, the parallel I'm thinking about is uh, Gutenberg's printing press and the Catholic Church. You know, Catholic Church would have liked the printing press never to be, have been invented. Uh, but but we all know now, in retrospect, yes, it was a confusing time, and yes, there was a 30-year war in, in Europe, 
but a lot of things became a lot better uh, after that. And I think now with a with a media landscape which is very which is very um, disruptive, I think we are in a similar situation. But I think the forces that are benign uh, will will eventually um, win. And I hope that we are sort of a sandwich generation. We are the first generation who has to handle with this flurry of information. And we're just unexperienced. And hopefully our children and grandchildren will do a much better job at, at distinguishing between facts and, and opinions. And that we can um, not screw things up too much until they are taking over. I mean, on the subject of grandchildren, it is, after all, also Keynes who writes on the uh, the possibilities for our grandchildren. So to, it would not it would not be doing him justice to label him a pessimist, after all. But I think the fragility is the thing that we're all getting at. So you could concede, Mike, that yes, it is true that we've escaped the Malthusian trap and it's all gone so fantastically well so far, but is that conclusive evidence that we should robustly expect it to go on doing so is really the question. And I think that's the question that Keynes is posing with, with you know, unrivaled, unrivaled force, right? That, that, that we have to recognize that's also the wake up call about the order before 1914. It's really very fragile. And there are places in the world where debts don't self legitimate. And so if we create a bunch of those in Europe, this will likely blow up too. It's very much the story that Catherine and you were they're telling that we so easily reify, especially now in the world of GDP data, which is coming into existence with Keynes at that moment, at the beginning of the 20th century, with those numbers, with that Angus Magasin data series. It's so difficult to resist the pull of a kind of crude teleology, and it's so difficult then to resist the temptation of creating this, what Catherine was calling these mythic narratives of, well, we had that order, and then we had this order, and in between it was a bit messy, but nevertheless, we always continue on the growth curve. But behind the scenes, what you see is an almost relentless effort at bricolage, constantly having to invent plumbing, new mechanisms. It never really sets, right? And that's a, that is an eradicable part of this reality of this, of this reality too. So I don't think it would be very unhelpful if we ended up trapped in a choice between pessimism and optimism, when it's really fragility and the, the kind of implausibility, really, of success that's so striking. Anyway, we had, uh, coming in here, David Vine. Can I just take up what Jeff Mann said about hoping that we could find a Keynes to lead us now and ask why and how? I, I remember when I was a student here, the very conservative master of my college took me aside one day and uh, criticizing a progressive young teacher of mine and said, why does he always have to do something? Why, why, can't, he, why can't he just sit there? And, and this was a person, Keynes, who always analyzed a problem to find a solution. And the, the genius was of the optimism coming through as a solution to what looked to others like an insoluble problem. So in the economic consequences, it's debt relief, even although it's debt relief of the kind that others have said can't be done. This, oh, all right, show me another solution. This is my solution. In the general theory, it's fiscal policy, even though ca classical economics said you can't do that. He says, this will work. I, in, in, the, in 1942, the clearing union is a proposal that Marshallian monetary theory thinks is mad, and yet he thinks this will solve our problem. And, and, and it works to Bretton Woods. At each stage, this genius finds something that others think can't be done and leads us through that. And I think this is the way that we can read Keynes, always optimistic, even though he describes things that look, before we read, as being things that we're so pessimistic about. And that's the task that he inspires of his economists to find a way to fix problems. John Dunn at the back. Thank you so much. I wanted to... Um to press a very simple-minded thought, which is that, the, that you have to look at the problems that we're facing now um, in terms of the conceptual possibility of their having been solved. And you have to think about what the solution might actually be. And I think it is right to, to putting the, uh, what Edward Carr and Jeff, sorry, putting what Edward Carr and, and Jeff Mann said uh, from different ends of the, 
of the podium together. I, th I think it's right that, that unless there is a coherent, a practically coherent, scientifically coherent um, response to the challenge of climate change, in a sense, there can't be anything but cumulative ca catastrophe. And the idea that political interaction will um, significantly mitigate that it doesn't make sense in the first instance. It can't mitigate that. We have the, the big problem is the Lenin and Hobbes problem. What is to be done? What is it that it would be good for the population of the world to converge on as the solution to the, the mess that human beings have made of their life together in the world? They've done all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, we can congratulate as it were, ourselves uh, vicariously on participating in all the wonderful things, but they have made an incredibly large and incredibly complicated mess. And unless there is a coherent way of unmaking the mess, or at least getting it back under control, uh, th none of these trends of thought converge on an encouraging outcome. So you have to be rationally, you have to be radically pessimistic. Either there is a solution or there isn't a solution. And, and if there, nobody has begun to suggest anything like what the solution might be in these discussions. And it doesn't, um, I mean, Keynes had a way of seeing how things would be much better, but it was a very class-specific way from a very um, <coughs> geographically specific place. And it, of course it didn't uh, in any sense at all address the, the problems of uh, most of the population of India or most of the population of China. Um, it, it, was, it was irrelevant in the short term uh, or actually in the longest run any of them were likely could in principle have. So we do need a different kind of way of thinking about what it would be for human beings to share the world well together, and we need we need uh, we need a picture. I mean, it doesn't rhetoric is fine for asserting a picture, but we need a picture of what it would be for things to be good again, not on a very local scale, but on a the scale of the world that we all actually have to share. And I think Keynes would have seen that all right. I think he would have seen it very very clearly now. Um, I don't necessarily think he would have had any I better idea than I do of what to do about it, although it must be true that he should have had, given who he was. But I, I don't think anything else is going to actually um, pull hard enough. We need, we need a solution to try to converge on, a solution which can be salient enough to ac actually change the way people feel about their being with each other. Uh, the, the, the drastic problems of now are problems of, of, of rising um, resentment and, um, and dislike between human beings on a very large scale. I mean, the, the world has got a lot worse from that point of view in the last um, 15 years or so, and it's going to go on getting worse unless actually we have some coherent way of how to make it better. And it can't be right that the way to make it better is just to run the, the best institutional expedients we've so far thought of in a less hopeless way than we are managing to run them at the moment. Jeff, this, I, I take this to be really a question for you to respond to. I mean, between David's, I think, absolutely accurate assessment of the, the crucial significance of optimism for Keynes. It's, it's not just... Uh, it's, it's actually a key opera, a key principle of his politics, also of his economics. After all, animal spirits is basically a measure of optimism. Um, it's widely diagnosed in the early 20th century as a key pre prerequisite for democratic politics to function at all, in fact. Um, by contrast, say, with the apocalyptic view of somebody like Hitler. But, but I do think that John Dunn introduces a, a key challenge in that we need radically to expand the, the scope of our thinking. And mm -hmm. Keynes remains a deeply parochial early 20th century Edwardian figure. Mm -hmm. And you in your book, Climate Leviathan, have said this emphatically. Right? I mean, the climate change problem is essentially an Asian problem for the next 10 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's where the drivers of climate change are. That's where the populations most directly affected are as well in terms of scale. If we mm -hmm. wait for numbers, that's where all of the action is. Mm -hmm. um, 
do we do we see therefore a kind of an Asian version of Keynesianism uh, as the future or lay out for us a little bit perhaps of the logic well, of your climate Leviathan uh, uh, book well, uh, sure I, I uh, I'll give it a go for sure I, I would say first that uh, uh, I think your point about Keynes's optimism is absolutely essential. And in many ways, I think you're getting at, you might remember in Economic Consequences at one point, he criticizes in general the politicians for their theological approach. And I think if we could characterize Keynes's thinking in one way, we would say it was anti-theological. He's always, uh, I mean, it's a simpler way of saying it might be he's a pragmatist. But, but like John was saying himself, the, the, the idea is that we come to the table to solve the problem. We don't come with the answers before the questions have been asked. And I think that a lot of economics in the past has operated in that way. I, I know how the world should work, and I try to reproduce it. And so I, I think that's absolutely a key part of his approach. Now, what he would have done in the face of today, I, of course, am in much less, uh, many people in this room are probably in a better place than me to, to predict that or to, to anticipate that. But I do think, though, that one of the preliminary steps to the kinds of things that you're describing, John, is to and this is part of what we're trying to do, I think, is to anticipate some of the trajectories that may be implicit in the current challenges, some of the ways in which we might expect existing powers to respond. Because the, the, the elaboration of anything like a kind of common goal that can rally or at least speak to people to, to, to make them understand and see differently the challenge of living together on this planet um, will also require anticipating the various forces that will, with s s degrees of good or ill will, make that project a challenge. That, that we're not going to convince everyone to come on board right away. And so part of the, I think, our, our intellectual task is to anticipate some of the challenges we might face in trying to formulate a new way of going about things. We can see the radical hope, but also radical obstacles that are being put up to the Green New Deal in the United States right now. It's being uh, I mean, in, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the, the proposed legislation. It's still in a very vague form, but it's nonetheless meeting extraordinary resistance and being written off as a sort of radical left project to translate, you know, to turn the U.S. into a socialist state or whatever. Um, there are people in the Green New Deal project who I know quite well who, who, who would hope for that, perhaps. Um, but that's certainly not the overall goal. It is much closer to the actual New Deal uh, now, whether or not it's workable is a different issue. But, the, but I think politically and, and economically as well, we have to approach this anti-theologically. It really is sort of a crucial first step. And that's a challenge both for those on the left and for those who feel perhaps that liberalism had the answers or provides mm -hmm. the progress that we've always been promised. But it also means, I think, thinking hard about the fact that when we talk about we, we often are implicitly describing a very narrow group of people. So if we say we've enjoyed progress for the last 300, 350 years, there's a big parts of the planet that that's less true of, the majority of the planet, arguably. And, and those folks are uh, not at the table. And it, I know we can tell the story of rising poverty, but if we look at the work that Nathan Nunn has done at Harvard, I mean, it demonstrates that the wealth levels in Europe and Africa in 1500 were the same. And we have de-developed Africa, arguably. So, these are crucial questions that we need to face in the, the formulation of a challenge that won't just be the creation of a, of a uh, green islands of wealth surrounded by Mad Max. Sorry, I, I that wasn't in, very... I'll bring, in, I'll bring in Jonathan. Um, just following up on that point, actually, I mean, you know, we're all technocrats sitting in one of the most technocratic cities in the world talking about a techn an uber technocrat whose solution to the problems of 1919 was more technocracy, really. And I'm just wondering whether... We're confusing, uh, sorry, and, we're, and when we're faced with, you know, what seems like irrational populism and an and a unwillingness or an inability to compromise on a lot of the issues that face us today, I, it's not really surprising that we in this room find that, feel that an existential threat. And I'm just wondering a little bit whether even on climate change, actually, whether we're just confusing a distribution issue, uh, something where, where, where redistribution might give people enough of a stake, in, of a, feel they have enough of a stake that they are then prepared to compromise, uh, might be a, a, an easier solution than, uh, than, than trying to lecture more clearly. <laughs> <laughs>
Does anyone want to come back on the distribution? I mean, one of the, one of the really bitter ironies of, of Versailles, after all, that's worth pondering is that the way in which the UK reparations bill escalates is by way of the externalisation of the cost of the welfare state. Lloyd George is the father of the British welfare state. Um, and making, making peace under terms like that in the aftermath of a total war turns out to be truly a problem from hell. Um, because the claims are absolutely omnivorous. Uh, and why is it that you know, somebody who's had their house trashed in Belgium should receive compensation from the Germans as opposed to a widow in Britain whose husband has been killed and whose life has, as a result, been ruined in material terms? Why is one compensation claim reasonable and historically legitimate and the other one in excess? And so that the, the, the problem of distribution can compound this problem of, of international uh, uh, negotiation enormously. But I have a question here. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to bring women into this, if, if I can, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, I think there is one big difference in terms of what we're facing today compared with back then, and that leads me to be more pessimistic to agree with, I think, the first question. And that is the position of women today versus back then. So right now, we are, um, look at women in the US, um, some of the uh, poorest women in the world, we're facing attacks on women's freedom, no more so than their bodily autonomy. Actually, we see that in southern states in the US, and we see Donald Trump's global gag rule, which is defunding birth control for some of the world's poorest women. Um, we've, of course, come out of a period in which women's rights, women's freedoms have significantly expanded, and so now we're going in the opposite direction. If you look at 1919, you'd come out of a period in the late Victorian period, the late 19th century, in which women's position was in some ways going backwards. So this is a period when you see the rise of the male breadwinner model. Before the Industrial Revolution, it was pretty standard for women to work, certainly in, in, in this part of Europe. And then as you go into the late 19th century, women are taking a, a backseat role. And, but of course, what happens after the war is then women start to make progress. So we have the, the votes for women uh, making progress here in the UK. We have in Soviet Russia. We have women now... Um, seen as an equal productive force, for good or bad, in the economy, compared with the time beforehand when men were given whips as a wedding present to, to, to beat their wives. Um, so I think I'm, I'm in some ways more pessimistic today than I was um, back then, and I think that brings me back to the population question. Um, I'm always a little bit skeptical of those that are bullish rather than bearish on population because I think I, I do see many of the political forces in the US that are wanting to control women's bodies by denying them access to whether it's abortion or birth control as quite liking this idea that we have got rid of Malthusian problems that population can keep on expanding indefinitely. Um, the reality is that almost one in two pregnancies globally are unplanned um, we have had for millennia um, population on the back of women's reproductive and caring labor, and I'm afraid that that is still to some extent um, where we are today. Um, my new book connects um, population uh, pressures, in, particularly in poorer parts of the world, with rising inequality here in the West. So I don't think we should rule out that population issue, which was, um, of course, where um, where. Um, Keynes's 1919 book started. What's fascinating about Keynes's politics in the 20s is that he has the capacity to think of political response to this question, right? So there's in the in, uh, in, in Essays and Persuasion, there's that remarkable passage where he says, you know, that liberalism's political success will be guaranteed in future if it owns the drug question um, and the sex question. And if liberalism can occupy that terrain, uh, in other words, and this goes to Jeff's point about theology, if we can eliminate the curse of Victorian morality uh, from public discourse, and if liberalism can occupy the terrain of the question of narcotics and people's desire to escape for short periods of time the misery of their everyday lives, and on the other hand, the question of bodies, sexuality, and the control of reproduction, then, as it were, the future of liberalism is completely guaranteed. Right? And this, I think, is a really non-legible, you know, the superficial and trivial ways of taking Keynes's sexuality 
and reading them, you know, this the famous uh, assault on his ability to think the long term and the fact that he'd never had it. This is an absurd level, but Keynes was in fact incredibly self-conscious about the political, political possibilities of the sex and gender question in the 20th century. And very few liberal theorists had the capacity, I think, to actually recognize that and to formulate it as explicitly as he did. Of course, one has, to be, one has to be conscious about, as you're saying, about the highly charged world in which that happens, because though, yes, there is the liberal story that you're referring to, historians of Italy, historians of Germany, and historians of the Soviet Union will, will tell a different story about a bash, backlash politics there, which by the 30s is in absolutely full swing. So that, that dynamism is, is really profound. We got, yes, we got a, a friend here from Princeton, Harold's collaborator. I want at some point for us to talk about Europe before the clock runs out on us. I, I can't, I don't feel that we can, we can, uh, we should talk about the Eurozone until we, we, we... This question's somewhat related to that. So it's about central banking in particular and about the, the responsibility, the frequency and the style of communication from central banks around the world. Um, and it, it seems to me that from 2008 to the present, you've seen the heads of central banks globally taking on a much more prominent role. They're in the newspaper more and more often. Their speeches at the Economic Club of New York are on the front page of the FT in a way that maybe that wasn't true in the past. Um, and from a, just to hear some, some uh, perspective on the pros and cons of that change and how it, you know, uh, how it changes the role of a central bank, whether that's good, whether that's bad, whether it doesn't matter. It seems that there's um, a lot more, more focus today on relatively small changes or comments in central bank policy. And I'd be curious to hear feedback on that. Well, Stanley and Cecilia, mm. this is uh, in your wheelhouse. You, you, you have the longer perspective, and I can give it, <laughs> come with an update at the end, okay? <laughs> Yeah, well, you're picking on the older people I, again. I'm I very know, shocked. Let's say anything about age. Um, please go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I, the, the sort of communications that are made, uh, which are highly technical, etc., it doesn't seem to me there's a huge benefit from going further and further on that stuff. Uh, the, of course, the people who are in the market want to know exactly what you think you're going to do three weeks from now. And I always answer, the reason that we have eight meetings a year is we don't know what's going to happen between now and the end of the year. And so we have a certain limit to what we can tell the public about the future. I think things which are reaching out, as the Fed is now trying to do, to, how, uh, to people who are not in the markets necessarily is very useful and there should be a lot more of that and the Fed is trying to move in that uh, direction. But I wouldn't sort of spend more weeks, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't increase the amount of uh, talking that the Fed people do in total uh, about the technical stuff. We've got 12 presidents of regional feds. We've got seven members of the Federal Reserve Board, and they all want to talk, and uh, they sometimes confuse as well. Uh, that is a really uh, uh, intriguing area. Uh, I think reason for why we, we see so much more uh, uh, coverage of, of what central bankers and central banking is about is that um, it was a great drama, the global financial crisis, uh, where the central banks were the ones to, to, to have the tools available and it was within their remits to, to use those tools. Um, I think also a reason for why it's so much excitement around or attention around it is that um, household debts have, uh, have grown in many countries uh, and um, you have more variable mortgage rates now than you used to historically. So uh, households are very exposed to what central bankers are, are saying uh, or not saying. Um, and given previous experiences from the media and financial markets, it's, um, it's a fantastic symbiosis there. I wouldn't say fantastic because it can be really discussed, but 
markets and media is sort of feeding each other in the excitement of, uh, of, uh, of these meetings. And uh, uh, is it good or bad, or doesn't it care? I think it's, uh, it's over it's blown out of proportion many times, because of, as, it, as, as um, Stanley says, it's, um, uh, we have to have many meetings because we, uh, we have to take in the data and we have to, to make our assessment as good as, as we can, but uh, we need many chances to get it right, and that's why we have the number of, of meetings we have. <laughs> It's it's tempting to press you, but it would be it would be it would be unfair. Um, you wouldn't get any answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, if we if we accept that the book is a Eurocentric book about a European crisis, uh, and that is clearly something that, in a sense, restricts its relevance to our current moment, um, where the challenges so many of those challenges are global. Um, Harold and I were talking in the, uh, in the break earlier on today about the way in which it's an incredibly haunting anticipation in some sense of the politics of Europe. Mm. Um, I certainly find it very difficult to read the book without thinking of the Eurozone. Um, and the, the intervention in the Eurozone debate, which seems to me, and this is perhaps going to produce indignation from the audience, that seems to come closest to the impact that that Keynes's book had is Yanis Varoufakis's um, uh, Adults in the Room. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me just put that out there and see uh, whether whether other people share that sentiment, whether that whether that rings true. Um, Harold, you you uh, felt I think that there was a, a sense in which the Keynes the Keynes example of the liberal economists riding to the rescue of the public against the benighted superstitions of the politicians was really a key theme also in Eurozone, in Eurozone commentary. I do think there are some parallels that are quite striking. Um, and one of them is the hope about or the belief in what the United States might do. Um, so uh, you remember the opening of the book, uh, Adults in the Room, is a discussion of a late night conversation in a hotel bar in Washington DC, not far from the White House, um, where Yanis Varoufakis is talking to Larry Summers. And the idea is really uh, that Larry Summers can persuade, it's, it's obviously still the Obama administration, uh, the Obama administration to press the institutions and the Europeans uh, to do something. Um, and uh, you, you know, I think that did reflect his honest belief in how things might work. And there were other people in the Greek government, uh, the prime minister um, thought that the person who could really have the leverage on on, on the Europeans was uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, and uh, there were other people in the administration who thought that China could do it. But in fact, all of them were wrong. Uh, I mean, this was hopeless as a way of doing this. And uh, Europe has to settle its own business. And one of the things that I think people are learning from the Euro crisis and the aftermath of all of the security crisis, the uh, Ukraine and the uh, invasion, uh, the uh, seizure of, of Crimea and the refugee crisis and the spillover and the uh, Trump election and Brexit is that y y Europe really needs to, needs to work, uh, can only work by itself and isn't going to get the advice from the outside and shouldn't actually want to get the advice from the outside. So it's, uh, it's I, I think, um, you know, in that sense, the, the, the book is flawed um, and his vision is flawed and it clearly didn't work. Harold, if I can just ask you a question. The lo why is the fact that the last two world wars were settled by the intervention of America not central to the way you think about the role of Europe. What has changed such that Europe can now do it without the Americans? That's a really, really important point. That's abso absolutely right. Uh, th that um, 1919 was messed up. Uh, we spent the whole day talking about that. And 1945 was triumphantly successful in the western half of the continent. Uh, so, ab absolutely. Uh, but. But that's a 
kind of state of affairs that I think it was unrealistic for anybody to expect to continue. And so, you know, already in the 1960s, uh, in particular, General de Gaulle is thinking that this can't last forever and we need a kind of European alternative to this. And, uh, you know, what's happened in 2016, but I think it was already implicit after 2008, um, is that, uh, you know, this is a world where the geography has changed, the economic geography has changed, and you're dealing in a world where emerging markets are much more important uh, and uh, where you simply can't rely on the United States all the time to do it. So, I, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it, you could have added the 1990s and Yugoslavia, um, that you know, when the Europeans were trying to deal with this, it was terrible. And then when President Clinton came in, it, 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 it worked out. That, absolutely right. But it's not the world uh, in the 21st century anymore. You know, as a central banker, one thinks about crises. And so I'd be forever, when I didn't have anything else to do, thinking about where is the next crisis coming from and how are we going to deal with it. And those stories always ended with the Americans put a group together or the Americans send in some troops or something. They always ended that way. Now, that's a, a critique of my way of thinking. But I don't know of others that have succeeded so far. So what is happening that is going to change that? So, I, I mean, in a sense, isn't, if you imagine this discussion taking place 100 years ago, um, there would be people who said exactly the same thing, that the British always came in at the right moment and they sorted things out. Um, and uh, it wasn't altogether happy, uh, but it, that was the view then. And you know, clearly one of the stories of the interwar period, and uh, it, it, Charles Kindleberg really beautifully always, I think, uh, got this right, was the sense that uh, the UK couldn't do that anymore. And uh, the, the consequence was that the United States needed to do it. But I think you're in the position where, unfortunately, uh, our country is more like the UK um, in 1914. Lee's wondering, I mean, as the mic passes, I mean, the US Federal Reserve is all over the Eurozone crisis all the way through 2011. Right? It's simply that Greece doesn't matter very much. I think that's the, the Greece overestimate their significance. But Elise, you... I'm not sure that I have an answer, but I would like to try. The big difference between today and before today is that until now, all the technological changes were based on externalities which were country specific. So when something happened in the US, it didn't move to Europe and therefore you had really a strong hegemony. Today, because of AI, because of artificial intelligence, because of Google, because of Facebook, because of all the transfer that we might think maybe that it is negative, but it is a, really a transfer of knowledge, we will have convergence of technology. We will have convergence of institutions which means that it will be very difficult for one country to stay above the other ones, and which means that Europe will have to take care of Europe. And there will not be any more one country with the externality staying inside the country. Thank you. I got James at the back. So, so it's coming down this counterfactual U.S. intervention in the, in the two world wars. So Keynes has this remarkable quote I was trying to find. I think it's from 1922 where he says, everybody's so worried about East versus West and liberalism versus Bolshevism. But, and then he makes an anti-Semitic remark. Well, that's just a weird Jewish thing. The real threat, of course, is nationalism. We still haven't defeated nationalism. Well, he's obviously right about the resurgence of nationalism, but he's obviously wrong about the fact that Bolshevism is going to inevitably collapse. It, maybe, but not for the, the better part of a century. So counterfactually, you say, uh, Stanley, well, the US had to intervene to, to, to end the Second World War. I'm not so sure. You know, George Kennan conceptualized the Second World War as a battle between East and West and a determination of where the line between East and West would be drawn. Would it be drawn uh, in, in Lisbon 
by the Red Army, or would it be drawn uh, if the Allies get the Western Allies get involved somewhere east of of, of Lisbon? And the, the this matters very much today because of China. Right? We underestimate China and its potential to play a UK US hegemonic type role in the global system, I think, uh, at, at our peril. And I, I don't have anything against China per se, but the torch was passed from a liberal democracy of the UK to a liberal democracy the US. Now the torch is being passed to an authoritarian regime, which is maybe a heartbeat away from another Mao type figure. Yeah, I would just add in terms of what's changed vis-a-vis -vis the reach of the US and the effectiveness of the US, very simply, um, Iraq too, radical overreaching, um, recognition for eight years of the Obama administration that in fact there was damn all we were going to bring to the Middle East that was going to be effective. Now the reach of American international power to resolve crises is resident in the person of Jared Kushner. Uh, this is not confidence inspiring and in fact echoing James I would say that in the global international political context, the lasting contribution of the Trump administration may indeed prove to have been its acceleration of China's rise, if not to hegemonic status, at least to global great power status. Stanley wants to come back. Ed. Yeah, I mean, I agree with almost everything you said. I'm asking the question, what is Europe doing about filling the gap? I just want to very quickly say there was one of the things that struck me about the foreign policy of the Obama administration is that um, it stood back um, and you listen to Obama's speeches to the UN General Assembly year after year. He stood back and said, um, we all want to, it's all in our interest to have a rules-based order. We've all got to do our part. Um, you know, we can do a certain amount, but you guys have got to step forward. There's a, there's a majority of countries out there, Brazil, South Africa, all sorts of countries, India, that can play their part. And you know what? Who stepped into that vacuum? Putin and Xi Jinping. And the, the, that, to me, the scary thing is that when Obama put out this opportunity for the rules-based order to cohere around, you know, it, it, around a system, in fact, it was the wreckers who, st who stepped into the vacuum and not the constructors. Following on from this, to pursue his th thought, which he led us to earlier, of how if the world had acted or could now act well, the integration of China into the global order might be managed so that war doesn't loom at the other end of the room. I don't know that that opportunity still exists, um, but I don't think I don't know of any uh, approach other than the Keynesian one, which is trying to get them into the global system in some way uh, that that would work. I mean, if you're going to go head to head against them, you're in a conflict already. And uh, we're trying to, that's what we're trying to avoid. So I don't, I don't, I don't have a solution to that. I'm just an economist. <laughs> I mean, it's striking that May 4th doesn't figure in the economic consequences of the peace, in retrospect. Right? 1919 means something very different to China than it means to Europeans, but it means something very powerful to China. And we are living with the, the legacy of that. Um, Giancarlo, you wanted to, to come in. Coming back to the question about Europe, uh, when, I, when I started working on this conference and started to read, uh, I understood that maybe the title would be the intended and unintended consequences of the book, <laughs> which is <laughs> judging from what I've, I've been reading. And, and this is an important question. You, you mentioned Varoufakis. In the European Union, and there comes to the question by Diane and, and Cecilia, uh, there was a paucity of there was a positive in the role of economists. I mean, if you take the Keynesian revolution seriously through the years, at the end of the day, what the economists were called for is really a de fundamental determinant input to democracy. This is what economic policy was about. It was about uh, clarifying to people, clarifying to the government, the consequence of these or the actions, so that the decision and the vote would be driven not by declaration of intent or, 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 or dreams, but by well-defined uh, 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 analysis of uh, what would happen if I vote this or that. So in Europe, we had a situation in which economies split 
into fields that were totally not really helpful. There was a, a fundamental view that came in very, very strongly judging the division of Europe as coming from roots of various kind, heavily morally. <laughs> and there was a totally equally false liquidity view, where you could actually undo the crisis just by you know, being generous. Those things were not only completely useless for the analysis, but politically poisonous, because they, they basically split the uh, analysis. And we waited years before a solution started to come up. And, and those years was what created, actually, the kind of imbalances that Keynes' uh, book is exactly identifying as the, the problem. Now, you, you, the, the threat of multi, to multilateralism and the non-zero-sum non policy is really avoiding those kind of imbalances. So this is like, I guess, the question. I, I, I'm, very, I'm very curious about any example of compromise you loved, Cecilia, because, <laughs> because at the end of the day, I don't see this as a compromise. I see more as a, 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 a nuisance, you know, an, an analysis. And in a way, there is a crisis. Economics goes through crisis. It's not easy to do those models. I've been participating for the OMTs the monetary transaction, which was, was really the turning point. And it was defatigating just, just to write the model and to discuss people and to convince the economic policy is not about extremes. Now, you cannot solve things by saying it's all fundamental, it's all liquidity. You need to understand what's going on, understand the, the, the link between this. And I guess, like, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure the study at the IMF will, will have many of these examples. And, and, and the, the problem is open. All right, here comes the compromise of all my love and all that I love. Um, uh, so uh, bear with me, I'm going to take you to Sweden in the 1990s. But in the early 1990s, we had a, uh, a considerable uh, economic um, financial crisis. I think uh, Rogoff Reinhardt book calls it one of the big four or big five. Um, and um, a, a great shock to the establishment and the political system. Now, what happened in the, in the years following that? First of all, we had help from the global recovery. I, I, I'd like to admit that. But something else was also happening in the Swedish society, which I found very inspiring, which was that all the mainstream parties were agreement that they didn't want to uh, end up in a similar situation again. And um, so the, the direction was very clear, that there was a need for budget consolidation. Uh, and that was independent on which party really people voted for. But if you voted for a conservative party, you would get more uh, spending cuts. And if you voted more to the left, you would get um, uh, tax hikes. But it was possible for the electorate to sort of express their preferences on how they wanted to get them, themselves <coughs> out of the situation. And in combination with, with the budget consolidation, a number of um, uh, structural reforms was also taking place. The central banking reform, the wage formation reform, uh, public finance, the budget process reform. Um, so I think it's an example of where the establishment actually, although they might be very much in disagreement, what's the problem and, and the, the way out, there was an agreement that you wanted forward uh, and it was up to the electorate then to express the preferences on how that movement was, was, made, for, was made forward. While I got the uh, talking stick, I'd like to make a, a recommendation, one more actually. Sweden and Norway got divided in 1905 uh, and as far as I remember my history knowledge, not a single shot was, uh, was fired in that, uh, that divorce. So, um, you know, it's possible. That's all I'd like to say. I think I'm going to seize that opportunity to call things to a close. But before we head out, can I just ask you to thank our fabulous panel for a really great discussion.